Helen Shaver made a name for herself with roles in big films such as The Color of Money and The Osterman Weekend, and she's worked under directing greats Martin Scorsese and Sam Peckinpah. Then she decided to cast herself as the director. Mm. How's that worked out? Well, this year she was nominated for not one, but two Canadian Screen Awards for Best Direction in a Dramatic Series. Helen Shaver, director of Orphan Black and Vikings, and so much more, joins us now. It's so great to meet you. Thank you. It's great to meet you, too. Thanks for making time for us, because I know you were up late last night. Oh, uh, yes. It's early morning. And it's early morning, too, for you. <laughs> so let's do a little background on you. For First of all, I cannot believe what I'm about to say. But here you are, born February 24th, 1951, in St. Thomas, Ontario. Yeah which makes you eligible for CPP. I cannot get over that. <laughs> anyway, grew up in a family of six girls, started acting professionally at age 18, mm -hmm. inducted into Canada's Walk of Fame 2004, won a couple of Geminis and a Canadian Film Award. And I guess, let's before we talk about you and directing and all that, I just want to go back a little bit. Mm -hmm. How old were you when you knew you wanted to be an actor? Um, well, I never th thought about it. I was terrified to talk out loud in front of people. I mean after about grade four, because uh, when I was little, I was in the hospital a lot, and I had a very big imaginary world. And you had, what was it, rheumatic fever or yeah, something Yeah, rheumatic like fever. So I spent a lot, like literally months at a time in the hospital, and I created a whole imaginary world for myself because I was too young to know that you were supposed to stay in your body, you know? Hmm. And anyway, so I had a kind of traumatic experience in grade four with my teacher who, when I was telling the class about this journey I'd been on told me I was a liar, that I knew I'd been in the hospital and that lying was a sin. And, you know, it was one of those moments where you just want the floor to open up and can I please disappear? And mm. so at that point I went underground sort of with my imaginary, well, my creative, whatever you want to say, it, it, that part of myself, I just sort of stopped telling anybody about it. And then at 16, um, I, I, I went to the public high school and J.J. Uh, Campbell convinced me to read... Um, a speech from an Elaine May play because he'd started a theater uh, co club and um, and I did it and he made me do it over and over until finally the words went in my eyes, jumbled around inside of me and kind of fell out of my mouth as if they were my own words. And that play, w the first time I performed it, I, I don't really remember the performance, but I really do remember the this sort of overwhelming feeling of, oh, hmm. this is this is where... It's not lying, it's acting. It's a bit it, of a eureka moment? It was just like, yeah, I, oh, this is where I belong. And, uh, and so really from there, other than a, a little sideways journey, when I was 20, I got married. And um, I, you know, back in those days, there was no Canadian film industry. There was, I'd never met a, really a, a professional actor or anything like that. Well, a little bit, but not really. And uh, I was, I think, really frightened by my own possibilities or my mm. own, like the, there was a kind of big world inside of me that I w had no idea how to direct into the world. Mm. How and much slogging did you think you had to do to sort of Never get thought of it like that. Never did, eh? No, no, mm. I never, listen, I, I have never had a career plan until the mid 90s when I, you know, by that time I'd, I'd had a, quite a, you know, extensive acting career and I started working with a manager who said, well, Helen, I really want to work with you, but you have to be able to tell me what it is you want. And I, you know, a good Canadian girl from St. Thomas, I'm like, well, I want to work with good people and no, no, what do you want? What do you want? What do you want? You want a direction. And mm -hmm. that's when I heard myself to say, I want to direct. And, mm -hmm. and, and so that was really, I suppose, the first time that I ever had a career plan, because she said, oh, OK, now we have a five-year plan. And I said, well, that's very Oprah of you, but <laughs> how does that apply to, I'm an artist. This is not some corporate sort of situation. And But did that mean Hollywood for you? Oh, I've been in Hollywood for ages by that time. OK. I, like, I, I, I started on stage here. By the time I was 22, I was acting in film on the West Coast. and 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 doing an American thing, and the Americans said, okay, you gotta come down to the States. And I said, well, why would I ever go there, you know? You didn't uh, wanna go there? At 22, the only Americans I knew were dra draft dodgers. And mm. in my, I was also afraid, you know, it's funny how fear and I don't wanna do it, which you can sort of align with a lot of 
terrific intellectual underpinnings, but really is coming from fear. Uh, I said, oh, I'll never go there, you know, an imperialistic country with an imperialistic war and no socialized medicine, why would I ever go there? <laughs> and then I thought, well, never is a long time. I should go and check it out before I decide I'm never going there. So how old were you when you, when you I tried went, Hollywood? I went to, tw at, at 22, I 22. went, I went uh, not with no driver's license, $350, uh, a list of 10 names that Hagen Beggs had given me. And I didn't, I'd never read a credit roll, so I didn't recognize that those names were, in fact, names like Richard Donner and the head of casting at Universal. I didn't know who any of these people were. And I was just this little hippie, and I went down and, and I said, well, Hagen, what do I do? He said, well, you just call him and you tell him you're my friend and that you're an actor and I've directed you and you have this wonderful resume. And, and you got meetings with them? I, 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 by the end of 10 days, they sent cars for me. It was, I, because I was so naive, I mean, and it was a different time, and, and uh, the head of, Casting at uh, Universal, Milt Hammerman said, oh, "Do you have an agent?" And I said, "No, I don't have any." Well, you need an agent. Oh, okay, well, I'll get. <laughs> I've got Patricia Neal. Twenty years ago, she's a fabulous voice. I'm sending her over. You sign her, we'll hire her, kind of thing. And <clears throat> anyway, the long and the short of it is, I ended up with an agent. Went back to Vancouver to do a, a play at the Arts Club, and and then I was called to from from one of the producers I'd met there to come and star in a movie as the ingenue lead with David Jansen and Hope Lang. And the agent had said, sweetheart, sweetheart, you get the job, we'll get you the work papers, because I used to drink scotch and smoke cigars in the office, <laughs> kind of madman-esque back in those days. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I said, oh, okay. And I, you know, I, they brought me down. I thought I'd been discovered. A couple of days before I was supposed to start shooting, I realized no one had ever asked me for a thumbprint or a signature or anything, and I called the agent. They hadn't done anything. They said, well, just make up a social security number. And I'm like, I can't do that. They said, well, that's what all the Canadians do. And I, oh, yeah, God, I can't do that. And <laughs> Welcome to Hollywood. Uh, yeah, so I ended up weeping in a lawyer's office who said, you know, are you a star in your own country? You have to become a star in your own country first. And I'm like, there are no stars in Canada. That's why everybody leaves. And, and anyway, that brought me back to, that brought me to Toronto. Where I spent four years, so I and I where came. Where you became here. a quote unquote star. Well, and, and for then some got to reason, go back. for some reason that was yeah, it, the the stars aligned in that you know mm -hmm. Sylvia Train, George Anthony, uh, all, all of these people who were of the press at that time, mm -hmm. for one reason or another, decided to. Well, they loved talk you. about me. Yeah. You know, you mentioned it a second ago in passing, and I want to just labor on it a little mm -hmm. bit. The voice. Mm. I mean, you know you've got that voice, right? Mm. Did you know how unique and distinctive a tool that would be for your acting career, you know, when you were in your 20s? No. I, like, I wish I could say I was so aware of... But really, I don't know if you remember being in your 20s. What I remember about being in my 20s was always feeling... I mean, there would be moments... What, what I loved about my work is when I was doing my work, all self-consciousness left because the... My concentration was on the person I was acting with, the director, the piece, what I was doing. But, you know, I don't know about you, but in the, for the rest of my 20s, a lot of the time you just felt like, oh, God, you know, I'd, I'd read, a, I'd read <laughs> auditions. If the word beautiful was ever in the character description, I would not get that job. Because I would spend literally hours standing in front of the closet in the mirror trying to figure out what it was I was supposed to do to make myself beautiful. Because mm. at that point, I still... It, it was in my mid-30s when I was <clears throat> large with child in the south of France where my, my husband was doing Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. And I was literally relieving myself in a lavender patch in the, <laughs> in, in, in the in south of France in Provence under a beautiful sun, where somehow in that you know, completely natural act, suffused with the pure frame of lavender, <laughs> that I felt beautiful for the first time in my life. How old and were you at the time? I was 37. That's the first time yeah. you felt beautiful. Yeah. I mean, listen, I felt pretty, I, but, but, yeah. but, but like where I just kind of got it. The you beauty it. is not, it's not, it, I, I love these ads that are out right now saying, how many times do you self-criticize women? How many times do you say, mm -hmm. my, I'm too fat, I'm too old, I'm too young, mm -hmm. my hair's too white, my hair's too blonde, my nose is too big. So, I mean, this is such... And you did all that? Of course I did. Yeah. You know, I was born in 1951. There were very narrow uh, ideas of what a woman mm -hmm. was supposed to be like, right? Mm -hmm. I, now, happily, I, with growing up in a family with five sisters uh, and no brothers, there was never, oh, the boys do this and the girls do this, you know. Um, my dad drove trains. We'd had no money. 
we all did everything. Mm. <laughs> right? yeah. And my mother was an incredible example of suit up and show up. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter if you say yes, yes is yes. And you and you go and you, and then you might so you learn those values. At that oh, point. totally, totally, absolutely. Have you seen the movie Carol? I, I have, yes. Because have you seen the movie Desert Hearts? Well, of, <laughs> of course I have, and that's why I'm bringing this up. Because I, you know, I'm exaggerating a little bit when I say you did Carol, but you did it 30 years before Carol. Before Lesbian Chic or any of the well, kind of avant-garde, I would say. And I'm just wondering what kind of a risky role that was to take on 30 years ago when it mm. wasn't quite so mainstream as it is today. Again, this is one of these things where I read the script and I just thought, what an extraordinary script and what a beautiful love story. And and it, and in fact, and this is, I've, is something that I, I've just mm. realized, because uh, uh, I was up for, uh, I won an award from this Women International Network uh, uh, a few weeks ago. And in thinking about what I wanted to say, I realized that I was 33 and a half when I did Desert Hearts. And at that time I had done multiple series. I'd been in big films, little films. I'd been, you know, television plays, commercials, blah, blah, blah. And I had never, ever worked with a director who was a woman. Hmm. And anyway, so Donna Deitch was my first female director. And so at the time, I just read the script and thought it was fabulous. My agents and various people said, oh, Kellen, I don't think you should do this. Because it was, in fact, was risky. But What did they fear for you? That I would be uh, stereotyped and identified as a lesbian and, and, and stereotyped as thus, I imagine. And they, they, just that it was politically way not acceptable, Difficult. I guess, in, in those yeah. days, right? I mean, um, Instead, you got stereotyped as somebody who knows how to act, which <laughs> yeah, is not it was, a bad thing. It, it was it was a great film to do, and 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 a, and a really very eye opening in many ways, uh, and a, and a great gift. I, in fact, I met my husband, the father of my children, my children, my child. I only have one, <laughs> <laughs> and, except for all my imaginary ones. No. <laughs> Could uh, a man have directed that picture? Well, n not to the same result. Not the same way, right? Right, I, I don't believe, no, I don't believe to the same result. And so that was the first time I, that it was a woman, female writer from a, a novel written by a woman, directed by a woman, produced by a woman, uh, with two women in the lead. And, and it made a difference. Well, it made it what it was, which was a very precious, beautiful little film. And I think Carol, Carol is a beautiful, beautiful film, and there are beautiful actors in it, and it looks amazing, and Todd's a great director. I think what we did in Desert Hearts, well, I know that about a year and a half later, uh, there was a Woman of the Year Award from GLAAD, and uh, they were giving it to Donna Deitch, and it was in uh, the ballroom at the Beverly Hills Hotel, and Patricia and I were asked to be guests. And as we came onto the stage, this room full of women stood on their feet. Now, I've, I've gotten standing ovations before, mm -hmm. and they're very moving. And it feels like it's about you for a minute. This ovation went on long enough for me to realize that it was not about me, but it was about the work and that we had actually done something to represent a group of people who felt so unrepresented in this human way. And, and the, you know, at the time I thought, man, if I never do anything else, I have, I have done one thing that really, really matters, you know? I'm going to quibble with you a bit. Mm. It was about you, but it was about more than you. Can yes. I put it that way? Yes, okay, I'll take yeah. that. Yes, it was about, but it was really about the fact that this group of people came together. I mean, we made that movie for $500,000. You know, <laughs> we all worked for, you know, I made $10,000 doing the film. Uh, that's what I made, and that's all I've ever made from doing that movie. Uh, I'd also met my husband, who just got an Academy Award, I have to say. No my kidding. My beautiful husband. For what? Uh, a, sci a scientific uh, technical award. You know how they say two yeah. weeks ago there were. Yeah, there. yeah, yeah. So he, he was got one, one of the of those. two. Yeah, for these for these uh, um, uh, modular inflatable exterior visual effects walls. They're called air walls. They're big exterior green screens. Fantastic. Screen. So that was fun. So there's an Oscar in your home. Well, you know, so it just Along means it needs another one, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. At what point do you just? Well, you've pointed out that you did all these. You did all this work and never for a female director. And mm -hmm. at what point do you say to yourself? Damn it! I, we we got to do something about this, and I'm the person to do something about it. Well, I didn't approach directing to be to to as a political movement. I it was it was simply from the time I started acting, 
uh, whether it was stage, but I'm a very visual person and I, so there's a visual level and then there's this whole other um, emotional, spiritual, whatever, mm -hmm. this whole other level. But when I read a script, I see it. And I, I see the movie that I see. And so through the years, I worked with some, as you had mentioned earlier, some of the world's greatest directors, the Peckinpahs and Schlesingers and Scorsese's. And I've worked with, I've had the privilege of working with some De Palma, some fun, wonderful directors. Um, I've also worked with many mediocre directors. And oft times, the movie that I saw was nowhere on the screen hmm. when it was all said and done. And sometimes I thought my movie was better. <laughs> and, you I can do better than this. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I or 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 I wanted to tell the story. I am a storyteller, as you mm. can blah 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 see. <laughs> <laughs> but wasn't and, it Scorsese at some point who said to you, "Helen, he you should direct"? Yeah, and uh, yeah, in the early '90s, I was I was on on stage with uh, Ellen Alda doing Broadway, doing Jake's Women, Neil Simon's play, and Scorsese, Marty, and I were having dinner. He was editing Age of Innocence, and we got into a, a discussion about a film, and he said, "You know." You, you, and I, mm. and, and apparently, <laughs> friends tell me I've been talking about directing since I was 20, but I don't actually remember that. And uh, so anyway, mid 90s, I met Connie. Connie asked me what I wanted to do. I said direct. She said okay. We we will make our choices as to what leads us towards that. And and so uh, about a year and a half later, uh, I, uh, I I accepted the Poltergeist, the legacy, the series. Mm -hmm with the stipulation that I, I would direct some Outer Limits, and that's how I leveraged it, because as Connie pointed out, they're not going to come along and say, you're a good-looking 47-year-old actress, let's make you a director. <laughs> Doesn't work like that. How did you even learn how to do that, how to direct? <clears throat> well, I, I mean, I, I've always loved the entire process of filmmaking. I was never sitting in my uh, trailer right saying, now. oh, call me when you're ready for my close-up. You know, I, I was always on the set, always watching. Uh, I, I mean, I think... I think filmmaking is such a remarkable thing because here you have like 150 people and some machines. Mm. And we're gonna tell a story in little two and three minute, minute segments, sometimes 30 second segments. Mm. And in order to do that, someone needs to be in the center of this to communicate what the story is, to focus everyone's attention, you know, and everybody's work is done in a sequential manner. And, and you know, little bit by bit, you, you create these little pearls and then you make it, you string them together. And so I was always, I always loved the process and, and, and was on the set and looking through cameras and before there was video feedback and saying, well, I don't know, well, why are you doing that? And, you know, and I was off times with generous people. So I learned a lot about that. When it finally came time for me to direct my first piece, what I didn't know how to do was how to prep because that was the part of the process I'd never been involved in. And, and so that was interesting. And the first time was like running naked through a gauntlet, I tell you. You came up <laughs> bloody and bruised. But my director's cut that I turned in, I felt was 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 better than the script. Hmm. You know what I mean? So, well, he here's why your directing is such a big deal. I want to hmm. read this out of Variety magazine. Okay. Um, it goes like this. Despite all the debate around the lack of opportunities for women, the film industry continues to be dominated by men, new research shows. In 2014, 85% of films had no female directors, 80% had no female writers, 33% had no female producers, 78% had no female editors, and 92% had no female cinematographers, according to the Center for the Study of Women in Television and Film at San Diego State University. Why does it apparently seem to be so difficult for women to be represented in these what have clearly become typically male jobs? You know, man, I wish I knew the answer. I mean, I think, I think, you know, there's some rudimentary things like people like to hire people they know. And they know men. Men know men. Men go, okay, let's go golf. Let's hmm. go to Vegas for the weekend. Let's, you know, you know, they might invite me to Vegas for the weekend back in the day, but probably not to discuss film. You know, hmm. uh, I, it's, uh, um, so I think that, that that's one level. And, it, and, and, and that's just human nature to a degree. But like with all prejudice, you have to overcome what we have practiced. You have to consciously overcome it. And, and it is shocking, truly. I mean, and I've, ne I, I've spent very little time concentrating on it because I, I don't think I would ever get out of bed 
you know, if you go, oh, well, I got no chance because it's a male-dominated, you know, mm-hmm. then just stay in bed. But so I haven't spent a, a lifetime concentrating on that at all. I've, all I've, I've just gotten up and gone and done. What do you think it'll take to open it up, though? It's happening. It's happening slowly. I, I, it'll be the next generation, I think. I, you know, my, my son is 27 years old, and I look at, at, at the tribe of his people, his mm-hmm. community, and they are so much, on every level, so much more evolved than we are, so much more conscious. They are conscious of these, uh, of, of these, and they go, what's wrong with you people? Whether it's, you know, same-sex love or transgender or interracial or uh, sexism or age, even ageism. The, mm-hmm. they're, they're a lot less affected by ageism, which, you know, now at 65, I'm, I'm <laughs> sexism and ageism they, ageism, they can get me. But like, but seriously, mm-hmm. why, it's not, so for me, I've just always placed my concentration on the work and, and, and try to, you know, I certainly do my, any young woman who comes to me and says, Helen, how do you, I say, well, follow me, come on, you know, hang out. Well, I don't know what I can do for you, but you can watch, <laughs> ask me questions, whatever, you know. And I think it is just, uh, you do the work and surround yourself from your own heart with some glory and let them come to you, I guess. I did see another statistic somewhere along the way, though, that said, I think 7% of the 250 biggest grossing movies last year were made by women. And it just seems to be that, it's ridiculous. yeah, it just seems that there's kind of no, the, the doors are closed. Uh, these statistics have got to change. And women have to stand up. And men have to stand up. Men have to, there's no way, it, it, it's like violence towards women. Who is more effective at curbing violence towards women? Women with men? No, men with men. Men have to do it. Men, have to do it. Yeah. men in your position, men, you know, Trudeau has set a great example. Yes, it's 50-50, it's 2016. What are we talking about? Of mm. course, here we go, you know? Uh, and, and, and so men must do their part. And, you know, I know some great men. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I'm looking at one. Well, you know, like, but, but it, it is really important because otherwise, you know, we become the annoying, oh yeah, here they are again, and talking about, them. oh yeah, poor them, whatever, you know? And the only reason this discussion is, is on the table is because there has been of this mm-hmm. to women. I mean, literally, I've walked into rooms with profoundly intelligent showrunners, executives. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking of one in particular whose work I just loved. And I came and I was like, oh, I really want to do your show. I want to direct. Well, I would really like to do that. I think it's fabulous. And I think I blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and the, the diversity in the, the directing in terms of race and all of that was was profound and i said so, you know but i you got you, don't you hire women and this brilliant man said to me you know helen wow yeah well you know but we had a woman in the first year and she just didn't get it <laughs> and i just was like uh, was was there a blue eyed man who missed it does that does that, that does that eliminate men forever well blue eyed yeah. men anyway yeah, right yeah. you know i mean it's like Wow. It's such a and and so there's an unconscious. Did you confront him on that? To a degree, yeah. yeah. And 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 I went on to work with him. Uh, uh, but it was, uh, you know, I I, I got to know who it was. No, you're not going to no, tell you me. No, you don't. You tell me afterwards. <laughs> nope. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you one last thing. Sure, Where do you sure. live now? Uh, Vancouver Island. Okay. Uh, is it a big deal to you to live in Canada? It's my choice. Because <laughs> you could live anywhere, obviously. Yes, yes, and 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 for many years I lived in LA. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I moved down there when I was uh, like 26 or something, 25, 26, and uh, lived there. And uh, our son was born there. And uh, from the moment our son was born, we started looking around. We were looking in Italy. We were looking in different places in the United States. We were looking in very, uh, you know. Did you didn't want to raise a kid in LA. Was that that's part That's right. Of it? Yeah. 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 Kinda I mean, hear that all the time. Well, it's, you know, I mean, the, Los Angeles has so many great things about it. But, you know, in terms of child raising, for me, I mean, I, like I say, I grew up in St. Thomas, Ontario, walking to school and coming home, holding hands and sneaking a kid, you know, whatever you do, right? And the idea of sort of driving a kid around and having play dates until they're 16 and then handing them the key to the Mercedes <laughs> seems kind of... Wrong. Well, it just <laughs> didn't quite, you know, it's we wanted to give him a little more. And a broader, yeah. you know, I, and, and, and so... 
Poltergeist, which was in Vancouver, happened when our son was seven, which was just perfect. He was shooting during the school year, so I took a house in Vancouver. Mackenzie went to to school there, and and it, you know, and when the four years of, on Poltergeist finished, and my husband had fallen in love, although he had been working every place else in the world and just coming there in between jobs, he had fallen in love with Vancouver. He said, "Helen, um, I will move my truck up here, uh, get my papers, and I'll I will." pledge to only work in Vancouver for the next five years so that you can come and go wherever you need to go. And, uh, you know, for a male child to have his father there, very, very important. And um, yeah, really big deal. He's a great kid. I got a great husband. I got a great life. I, I, I am like the luckiest person I know, <laughs> I have to say. I think I might be now, because I got to meet you. Oh, thank you. Anyway. Thanks for doing this. Oh, my pleasure. It's a great pleasure to meet you. Thank you. And continued success on both sides of the lens. I hope this all made sense in, it in sure a did. scribble rabble. It sure did. No way. This was fantastic. Okay, thanks. Thank you. It was very nice. <laughs> Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.